We need to have some concepts that are going to advance our understanding. You're all familiar with shopping, so you can all describe it in a lot of detail. But if we can generate some new perspectives by working, interacting with new ideas, then that's to everybody's benefit. So what sort of ideas am I talking about? Well, one kind of idea is the major tool we have used in many of our tourism studies. It's the idea that people can be mindful or mindless. Mindful is when you are actively paying attention, truly engaged in listening to what is going on. Mindless is when you are pretending you're listening. Most students are fantastic at this. Pretending you're listening, showing with the smile and the look that you're listening and really you're thinking about, gee, I'm getting kind of hungry now. I wonder when he's going to finish so I can go out and get something really nice to eat from Singapore. Oh yes, that's why he's talking again. Mindfulness is really engaged, really listening to what's going on. Mindless less so. This is going to be an idea about really capturing people's attention versus having them not really pay attention. We've done many studies in museums, in theme parks, in zoos, and so on. And when you do studies in places like museums and art galleries, what you notice so very, very clearly is that the first two rooms, the first two exhibit spaces that people go into, they spend a lot of time. Second and third gallery, a bit less time. If there's 500 paintings, as there is in the Prado in Madrid, of the crucifixion, people spend time on the first five, a bit less on the sixth. By about painting number 200, people are just walking past it. They've got into a mindless state. You can change that if you put a photo of a lady without any clothes on. People go, whoa, whoa, what's going on? It's not a crucifixion painting anymore. <laughs> Surprise, novelty, all sorts of ways make people mindful, gets them out of a mindless state. So at core, this is one of the ideas we're going to explore. A second idea. Since 1999, when some papers written by the Harvard um, business guys, Pine and Gilmore, there's been a lot of talk about the experience economy. The experience economy has actually been known in tourism a bit longer than that. What the experience economy is about is to say people aren't looking just for an activity. They're looking to have a genuine experience they can remember. I'll give you one small example. One morning I was lucky enough to be in Las Vegas. I was with some family members. And we were waiting for three quarters of an hour for breakfast. It's a long wait, a lot of people in this restaurant. So an entertainer came up, a guy dressed in a magic suit, and shook my hand, did some tricks with cards, did the classic magician trick of changing my $20 note, which I gave him, which he asked for, back into a $1 note to see if I was paying attention to it, and entertained us during the time we were waiting for breakfast. So that time seemed to go past really quickly. But the really memorable thing that he did right at the end of this 20 minutes, was said, oh yes sir, and here's your watch. When he had first shaken hands with me, he'd taken off my watch without me knowing about it. Now I remember that breakfast, I remember that occasion because it made me mindful, made me remember the experience. The experience was something that I'm going to recall for a long time because it was different, made me mentally active and mindful. So the experience economy, giving people something they can genuinely take home as a memory it's a theme I'm going to get back to. Being authentic is another one. People believing that this is not a set up place, but a place where people are genuine, where they're showing sincerity towards you, can also be a leading issue in having people satisfied with an experience. So sincerity of the people, interesting concept, leading to a belief that it's an authentic, genuine kind of place. Being different being regionally distinctive. People being able to go, okay, I know where I am. I'm actually in Mauritius. This actually feels different to all the other islands I've ever been to. It's got all these thousands and thousands of images of dodos everywhere. I've got a clear, clear idea of where I am. 
being regionally distinctive, we'll talk about products, we'll talk about locations that make that work. And co-creation of experience is the last idea, that you work together with somebody, maybe your family members, maybe the retailer, maybe the person selling you stuff, to provide this memorable experience. Co-creation is when you share things. And I'm going to talk very briefly, and there's some papers written, um, you can follow this up and I can talk to you some more about it, but about humour and the way humour works to engage people, to connect people, so they share an experience. I'm going to summarise findings rather than give you a lot of detailed numbers because um, that's for a more written and more, I suppose, um, consulting environment to give lots of detailed numbers and figures. So I'm going to give you themes in what we found out rather than um, lots of charts and tables and numbers. We have the tables and numbers, but um, for this talk it's not going to be about that. And as I flick through these slides, there's a number of images of certain kinds of shopping environments which um, hopefully illustrate um, what I'm talking about. Okay, we're going to talk about our program of research at James Cook University, which is about something called tourist shopping villages. I'll explain what they are in a minute. But we're going to talk about the insights we get from studying a particular kind of shopping, and in studying this particular kind of shopping, I believe we can put together some fresh perspectives on shopping in general. And that particular image is from one of the villages we looked at, which is Burford in England. And the theme, the style, from a researcher point of view, from an analyst's point of view, shopping is such a major activity that gaining new insights is difficult. It's hard to get a fresh way of looking at it. So our approach has been to look at a specialised form of tourist shopping and benefit from its special features. And this is a reasonably common thing to do in social science projects. To look at an outlier, to look at an odd case, to look at something a bit unusual and then use that odd case to reveal fundamental features of what's going on. And the most famous example, probably for those of you who have a psychology background or are interested in brain physiology, was of course the Canadian railway worker Phineas Gage. This was back in the 19th century. And what Phineas Gage did was he managed to put a crowbar through his head. Fairly spectacular. Big steel bar, really thick steel bar, like that thick, through his brain. And he survived. Really, really unusual situation. In through that part of the temple and out through that part of the brain. This guy survived. And all that really happened to Phineas Gage was that he went from a really happy person to a very grumpy person. Now, you might go, yeah, anybody with a crowbar through their head is going to be fairly grumpy. Fair enough. But that particular study, a really unusual case, an outlier, taught us a lot about different parts of the brain and what they did and what, what you could live with and without and what the frontal cortex did and so on. So this is the style. So we've got some outliers, some unusual ones, and see how that reflects back on the broader issue of shopping. So what is this thing? called a tourist shopping village. They're small towns, little locations, that base their tourist appeal on retailing. They're often in a pleasant setting, often with historical or natural features. They're found along tourist routes, they're in destination areas, they're usually reasonably near an urban centre or a source of population. But they're markedly different from urban business and shopping districts because they're small, They've got special retailing, and they've got a distinct feel for them. And I'll show you some examples as we go through it. Now, a friend of ours, Don Getz from Calgary, did this um, definition a few years ago, and we've followed this sort of theme. The focus is on Western countries, where these shopping villages exist, but much of the work is applicable to parallel settings in other locations. So these little specialised shopping villages, how might they be relevant to some other locations? Well, they're certainly somewhat similar to regional markets. So there's some ideas from the shopping villages we're going to be able to apply to regional markets. That image is actually from Hungary, I believe. They're somewhat similar to attractions which exist and which have shopping near them. This is quite a common Asian situation. That image is from Japan where you've got a major attraction and then you've got this kind of retail close to it. 
And there's some many examples near World Heritage Sites and so on. So the shopping villages have that kind of feel to them. Um, those of you that have been to Nong Ping in Hong Kong uh, will know that there's a constructed shopping village um, between the giant Buddha and the top of the sky rail. So there are many locations where this happens. And the shopping villages might have some relevance to um, major shopping streets in cities, but it's a different kind of relevance. Although, just in the sheer mindfulness point of view, sheer chaos itself um, can keep people mentally awake. 